my name is Gwen. I'm an indie developer. I've been in the industry for 12 years now. Um, these are some of my credits. I, I started out in online games working on Marvel Heroes. I worked in the Bioshock Infinite franchise. I founded an indie studio with several other people. I did that about five years ago. And a year and a half ago, I, I did the craziest thing I've ever done. I quit all of that and I went solo. I founded my own indie studio to make uh, one specific game, Kine. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about Kine. This is a narrative puzzle game. It's about six hours long. It's got a wide variety of spatial puzzles. There's different characters that have their own way of navigating the world. And you have to kind of figure out how to move through the world with these characters. And as the game progresses, you have to complete different puzzles like Sokoban style stuff or sliding puzzles and so forth. But what makes the game unique is that the mechanics aren't introduced arbitrarily. The mechanics exist to tell a story. So when I have sliding puzzles in the game, those puzzles exist so that two characters can go dancing together or go on a boat ride together. All of the mechanics service the narrative of the game. That's the point. Kind is a game that tells a story using puzzles. I released this game on PC um, just last year, actually, at the end of the year. I released it on console as well and, and on Google Stadia. And I'm happy to say that this game was very successful. I'm really proud of this game. I loved making it. But I have to admit, when I started making this, I, I didn't sit down and plan to make a six hour puzzle game that tells a story with puzzles. That's crazy. I'm, I would never do that. Um, I'm not a designer. I've never actually wanted to be a designer until I made this game. Uh, in all my years in the industry, my background has always been in animation, tech animation, and sometimes in the business side of things. So I, I don't have a design desire to do this. And, and honestly, in all of my years in the industry, I've never worked on a puzzle game. I never even considered making one. In, in my time as a person running a biz, like uh, helping to run an indie studio, if you had asked me before this game what you should make, what, what's a, a good idea for something to make, I would not have advised you to make a narrative single player game without any replay value. These are not the kinds of games that tend to be really successful in the marketplace for indies. This is not the kind of game you should invest a lot of time or money into, right? But I did, is the problem. I definitely did. I spent two and a half years of my life on this game. I spent $420,000 on this game. And that's a lot of time and a lot of money uh, to put into something that probably I would have advised against. Early on, I would have said that this wouldn't be a commercially viable product. But I spent that time and I spent that money and I have absolutely no regrets. I'm really proud of this game and I love it. Um, and so that's what this talk is about today. This is a sort of a postmortem, but I'm going to explain what I was thinking as I developed the game and how I came to the conclusion that I should invest this time and this money. And I'm going to go over some of the things I learned along the way. And it's going to be difficult to explain exactly uh, what I was thinking when I came up with the idea for Kine, but I did used to record my desktop at all times so I can show you. Before I made Kine, this is what I was doing. I had a full-time job and I was messing around after work in blueprints, uh, blueprint scripting for fun. And I was mostly trying to explore different animation ideas. I had this idea in particular of a character that like a humanoid character that would roll around in the world and kick off of walls to move around rather than using run cycles and so forth. I, I prototyped that character with a cube that had kind of like appendages that would extend. You can see here, this is the beginning of that prototype. And as I was coming up with this tech for this this thing that would be a humanoid character, I, I, I honestly just really liked the cube. I just liked the way the cube moved. I thought it was fun. I So in the beginning, I was just working on animation tech. And I really liked the animation tech I was doing, and I wanted to make a game to justify this tech demo. So in the beginning, I, I sat down with this tech demo and I thought, can I make a game out of this? Can I justify a reason to keep working on it? So I started working on a puzzle game. Um, and I call this phase the brainstorming phase. I, at this point, I didn't even realize I was making a game yet. I just had an idea. I like the way this character moves, and I want to come up with a something game-like that uses it. And you'll see here uh, different things I tried. Maybe the limb gets in your way and it blocks you from moving around. Maybe there's sliding puzzles. I tried things where you're like a Tetris shape that tries to roll through holes in the walls. I just experimented a lot with different mechanics that were interesting over the course of about four months. And when I thought I was onto something, I made a video of it. 
So after four months of the brainstorming phase, I made this video. Uh, and I sent it to my friends and I asked them if they thought I should make this into a game. And I completely ignored their advice because I didn't care. I, at this point, when I made this video, I pretty much knew that I, I wanted to make this game. Um, but I also keep in mind that at this point I was working after work. Um, and I knew that this making a puzzle game probably wouldn't be a, a commercially viable project. So this was going to be a hobby project of mine. And at work, right when I made this video, we were going down to working about 20 hours a week, part-time. So I realized at this moment, I wanted to make this hobby project and I had the time to do it. Um, and I came up with a plan and I call this plan the first scope of the game. At this point, I had decided that I would make a game. I had spent four months brainstorming and, and playing around with different ideas. And I knew I had 20 hours a week that I could spend myself for about three to four months until I had to go back to being full-time. And I figured that was enough time to make about a one hour puzzle game if I scoped it tightly and I, I focused. And I figured I would spend this time, I would make a one hour puzzle game that just kind of refined what I had already built during that brainstorming phase. And so now I'm gonna go over some of the things I learned during scope one. At this point, as far as design goes, I, I had never made a puzzle game before. Uh, so a lot of those early puzzles were kind of pointless and boring. I cut basically all of them and remade them. And I've put a lot of my focus into making sequences of puzzles that I found interesting. Early on in particular, I was really interested in the idea of having a preset order to puzzles. I really like a crafted experience. I thought it'd be fun to introduce a mechanic and then introduce another mechanic and then have a puzzle that combined them. I wanted to really control the experience of the player going through the game. Uh, I like that. I, I like the idea of having that kind of uh, crafted experience, but you'll see that that's kind of controversial among puzzle designers. A lot of designers would argue that you should put your, um, you, you should have your puzzles in a, a nonlinear order. You should be able to jump around from puzzle to puzzle. So if a player gets stuck, a player has a different thing that they can kind of jump to and a different thing that they can play. Um, and there's good reasons for this. If you get stuck in a puzzle game, it is very frustrating, more frustrating than any other genre. Uh, it's important that you're able to jump around and play something else because if, I guess the best way to explain this is with other games. If you're stuck in a game like Super Meat Boy, every time you fail in Super Meat Boy, you at least feel like you're getting better. You feel like your skill is progressing. When you fail in a puzzle game, you don't ever feel like your skill is progressing. You've either, you've figured out the puzzle or you have not figured out the puzzle. And if you're not, if you haven't figured out the puzzle, you don't feel like you're closer to figuring it out and you're just getting more and more frustrated a lot of the time. And so it's very important for a puzzle game to give the player the ability to, to leave and go play something else um, as soon as possible when they're stuck. And if you have a very difficult game, it's important to give the player a lot of different uh, puzzles that they could go play. But in spite of this, I really wanted that crafted experience. And so I kind of came up with a hybrid solution at the time. I decided to lay out my puzzles in sequences, but have multiple sequences that you could jump between. So this UI kind of shows off what I was going for there. I, I took the puzzles, I clumped them by mechanics, and I came up with the concept that they were each different characters. There was three different characters in this game. And that way I knew there'd be at any time three different kinds of sets of puzzles that the player could go between. Uh, and so that's something I figured out as far as design goes in the first scope of the game, and we'll get back to that more later. In the first scope of the game, I also had to make a lot of art decisions. A lot of important art pillars were figured out. Um, specifically, I decided that the game had to have a sketchy art style because this is a game where you have to cross these gaps in the world. And I needed the player to see where they would land when they crossed a gap. So if I had a sketchy art style, I could have a line that kind of overhangs the world and I could have the I could show the grid of the world in negative space so that the player could actually see the board that they were playing on. Uh, another thing I locked down as far as the art goes was the character design, which seems, I guess, uh, obvious in hindsight, but the characters had to be designed very intentionally. The mechanics of the game are a bit unusual in that you can stand up off of a limb. A limb is, is load-bearing from the side, but or uh, uh, you can stand up off of a limb, but the limb will not bear any load if on the side. So like if, if the body rolls off the world, uh, if the body of a character rolls off the world, the limbs will not support weight. Or if another character rolls onto a char different character's limb, that limb does not support weight. So the, the limbs had to look flimsy. They had to also somehow look like they could um, maintain your weight if you were standing on them. And 
Also, I needed a way to ground the characters in the world. There needed to be very clear color separations between uh, the different grid units, the different grid tiles that the character was occupying at any time, so that you could kind of feel out where the character was in the world. This is important to make the, the game playable, really. And so that's a lot of the stuff I figured out in the first scope of the game. It took about four months, and after four months I, I made this video and I brought this video to GDC. Um, this was a trailer of scope one. I showed it at uh, GDC 2018. And, and this is a trailer for a playable game. This version of the game was two hours long. I, I was aiming for one, but I hit two. Uh, and it wasn't completely done. Uh, I did need some UI fixes. I did need a lot of bug fixing. The, the game would crash at times, but it was feature complete. And it was something that I could have polished up and shipped in my free time if I, if I wanted to. But I didn't want to because I took this to GDC and everybody really liked it and everybody was really supportive. Uh, and I, I just didn't feel ready to be done yet. I decided at this point, because my GDC experience was so positive, that I would continue working on the game. And so I sat down and I made a plan for that. And that plan is scope two. And what this was, was I decided, okay, I've completed scope one. I know exactly what that game would be if I shipped it. I, I have it basically done. But I'm not happy with it. I want more mechanics. I want more variety. Uh, I didn't feel like I'd explored everything that this game could do yet. Um, and I talked to I, I talked to my coworkers, and I decided to stay part time for about six to ten more months to just help me figure out what I wanted to do to complete the game and, and wrap up the game. Uh, and this scope two was probably the most fun. This is when I think I did the work I liked the most. This is when I decided to both add mechanics to the game and also add a story. Because at the time, in my head, these characters had personalities. In my head, these characters were talking to each other. But none of that was actually in the game, in the original like puzzle game I had made. And I, I wanted to actually put that in the game. And so I added a narrative. And the narrative drove the mechanics. Um, so for instance, when Euler and Rue were in love, I wanted to show that somehow. So I thought, well, what would happen if two characters were in love? Maybe they go dancing. And I looked at choreography for figure skating, and I tried to design puzzles that would make you dance. And that's how I came up with the ideas of these kind of sliding puzzles. It's actually based on a, watching a lot of figure skating. Um, on the other hand, later on, I, I decided I wanted them to fight. And so what would it look like if these two characters would fight? I actually didn't have to add any extreme new tech there. I, I just had to fit the characters on the same uh, I just had to fit the characters in, on a smaller board in order to kind of get that. And so I was designing puzzles that looked like they were fighting. Or here, Euler is injured. Um, and I wanted him to feel like he was limping. I wanted him to feel hurt. And so I designed puzzles where you would have to literally limp through the world. I mean, Euler's always constrained in his movements, but here he feels particularly helpless. This is the kind of stuff I did in the second scope of the game. And, and this is the kind of stuff that was honestly my favorite. Uh, if I could go back again, I would... Um, throw away a lot of the earlier puzzles. I think what I found was as soon as I had a, a purpose or an intention for the puzzles, the those puzzles were just much stronger. They were funner. It was more fun to make. It was easier to make. And the puzzles tended to sit in the game in, in, in a better way. They had a purpose. Um, simply exploring a mechanic, I, I didn't find that those puzzles were necessarily the strongest ones. If I could go back again, I would probably have caught a lot of the, the main stage stuff not because it was bad, but because it, it didn't, those puzzles didn't really have a purpose. They, they didn't really, they weren't crafted with any kind of intention. Uh, they weren't as grounded in the game as the puzzles that were designed specifically to tell a narrative. And, and that's something I learned in scope two. That's the second scope of the game. Uh, and I had a lot of fun with that. But if you look at this kind of timeline here, you'll see uh, at this point I had spent, what, four months brainstorming. Uh, four months in scope one and eight months in scope two. So that was a full year that I had spent working part time. Um, this year, I, at this point, I had spent a full year working two jobs. Uh, and that was important because I needed the money, but it was really killing me at the time. I, I didn't feel like I, I was burnt out. I didn't feel like I could keep going. I felt like I wasn't putting my all into my job, uh, my, my proper job. <laughs> I felt like I was putting way more energy into kind at home. Uh, and so what I figured I would do at this point, I, I worked it out with my coworkers and I decided I would quit. I would found Chump Squad. And the goal was I would found Chump Squad. Uh, at this point, at the end of Scope 2, I had a, another game that was completed that was longer. It was about six hours long. 
uh, without final art. The art you saw there was um, final art, but the art, the actual art for the game was the the art you saw from from Scope One. Uh, so I had this this finished game, and, and I figured I'd quit my job. I would I would wrap it up. I would ship it within like two months, and then I would take a break, and then I would get another job again. And the reason why I felt like I'd have to get another job again was because I really did not believe that the version of the game I had would do well in the marketplace. I was proud of it. I loved it. I thought it was really fun, and um, I was excited to ship it and show it to the world. But I knew it wouldn't be commercially successful for a lot of reasons. The biggest being I, I didn't have any kind of marketing plan. Um, I, I didn't think the art in the the version that I had at that point would stand out in the market. Uh, I, I didn't... I just, it looked bad. It didn't look like something that would be successful in the marketplace. Uh, and, and there was some UI UX stuff I, I hoped I could get to, but I wasn't sure I'd have time before I ran out of money. So I, I figured I would ship this and then I would I would have to get another job. But just in case, since I'm quitting my job anyways, I figured I would take one week and I would put together a pitch deck and I would send it out to all the different publishers. Um just in case somebody would bite. And this was a long shot. You have to keep in mind, if you pitch a game to publishers, I've done this many times, generally from the moment you pitch until the moment you actually get revenue, that's like at least six months. Six months after you pitch is the earliest you're going to actually see money in your bank account. And I knew I would probably have to launch the version. I would have to launch kind before then. In my head, I didn't think I'd make it that long. So this is really more of a Hail Mary. But as it turns out, Something really unexpected happened. I quit and I found a chump squad, and three weeks later, the Epic Game Store launched. And a matter of a couple weeks after that, I had a signed exclusivity deal with Epic Games, which is how I funded Scope 3. And I'll get into Scope 3 in a second, but I should say that this was the biggest stroke of luck imaginable. I had no idea this was coming, but uh, I was very lucky that I happened to... Um, have gotten an Unreal Dev grant for Kine already. <clears throat> Kine, Epic already knew about Kine when they launched their storefront. They, I already had their emails. It was very easy for me to get in contact with them. They knew who I was. And so get it, banging out that deal, explaining the situation and banging out that deal really quickly um, was an unexpected huge advantage. And it really, that is the entire reason I was able to do scope three, which brings me to scope three. So at this point, what I had was a game that I liked as far as the design goes. I was really happy with it. It was, I had figured out in scope two what I was doing. I was making a game that told a story with puzzles and I had made those puzzles um, and I was proud of it, but I didn't think it would be commercially successful. And so at this point, I, I had a set amount of money. I couldn't spend more than that. Um, <clears throat> and I had a designed game and the goal was to take that game I had and make it market viable. Specifically, I wanted to polish the environment art, the UI, and I wanted to port and localize the game because I had enough funding to do that. <laughs> I figured I could work full time and I could hire a couple of contractors and I needed to wrap up what I had in about eight to 10 months. Um, I still didn't really have a marketing plan, but I figured maybe I could buy, uh, like hire a PR company and um, maybe if I just came out on a lot of platforms, part of why I came out on a lot of platforms was I had this idea in my head that it, if I could just be on every platform, I would get marketing from each of them and, and they would reinforce each other and it would create some buzz. Anyway, scope three is when I was funded. So this is when I should probably talk about the budget because the vast majority of the money was spent in, in this version of the game. Uh, in total, I spent $420,000 on Klein. That does not cover my salary, uh, but that covers absolutely everything else I mean, that covers paying for the contractors that I hired in this phase, um, also paying for the company when I initially set that up, uh, going to PAX, the flights to GDC this year that I didn't get to take because of the coronavirus. Um, so this is the amount of money I spent total for everything with Kine. And you'll see, you'll see here, I, I spent $210,000 on art and pretty much all of that went into the environment. So let's talk about that first because that is the biggest part of my budget. I did... I worked with about four artists over about four months to revise the art style. That's not perfect, but I, I hired Surface Digital to help me with the art style. And what we did was we 
we tried a couple of different things. I, I had this abstract kind of painted art style initially, and I knew I wanted to keep that sketchiness for the reasons I talked about before. I, I liked the idea of having lines that overhang the world, but I wanted the objects to have some kind of uh, some basis in reality. I, I wanted to come up with something a little higher fidelity, more interesting for the environment. I worked with the artists to do this, but we, we rapidly found we couldn't have too much high frequency detail in the environments. It would distract the eye. And as soon as the player couldn't see the, the puzzle board, the player was completely lost. Um, we had a lot of other problems. It was very necessary to never have anything not align with the grid. If there's ever really long lines that don't align, align with the grid again, the player would have difficulty seeing the puzzles and the puzzles are already hard. Uh, it doesn't feel fair if you're failing on a puzzle because you can't see what's going on. This is a huge problem in kind. Even if you're very careful to have all of the lines align with the grid, you can still end up with optical illusions like here. Do you see this brown box in the foreground? Uh, it's hard to see where that is in Z height. It's hard to see if that's the same level as the, the white boxes or not. You have to kind of turn the camera just to see it. This is an optical illusion that you have in kind, and there's a lot of other optical illusions very, very similar to this that had to be troubleshooted, basically. And I'll tell you the way I solved this particular one was I added a scribble shader to Kine. So anytime you can't land on, um, land on a grid tile from where you are, you see kind of a scribble. And that's consistent throughout the game. So the player, is tr their eye is trained to see where they can land and where they can't land. And that becomes more important later on when you can change the height for different reasons or when you can switch between characters. Uh, it, th this is one trick I did. Um, going more into the art in scope three, I would say I made some kind of questionable production decisions in scope three, as far as the art goes. I was working, uh, with a very small amount of time. I was trying to work as efficiently as possible with a bunch of outsourcers. So I took each puzzle and I took all the static meshes from them and I merged them into one static mesh and I would outsource that and I would bring it back in and I would put that back in the editor. And that's how I up the the different um, puzzle pieces as quickly as possible. But this also meant that I couldn't edit a puzzle, right? As soon as I merged all these meshes together uh, and exported them as an FBX, now at this point, I, I can't change any puzzle unless I go into Maya and actually change the final art for the puzzle, which means at this point, no, I couldn't change the puzzles if I wanted to. And I would say that's a, it's something I could get away with because I knew I was locking down the design at the beginning of scope three, but it's something I would definitely recommend against. Uh, I, I hate that. I, I like that there are certain areas that are still tile-based, like the boat area. This is done entirely through um, through tiles and, and using shader tricks to, to make the tiles look differently. I vastly prefer working this way. I think it's really important to be able to iterate on the design throughout the entirety of production. Um, so that's what I learned in, in scope three. Uh, as far as the art goes. And like I said, I spent about $210,000 in four months uh, on just that, like working four months of my time as well, full time working on that to overhaul the environments and the UI art. And that was the correct call. I'm really happy with how the art turned out in Kine. I think it really did help position the game well in the marketplace. Um, but if you look at here at the chart, you'll see there's a sizable part of the budget that's spent on porting. And I, uh, that wasn't just the budget. That was also my time. I spent three to four months on kind full time on localization and porting this game. And that was a bad decision. I regret that. I do not recommend doing that. I think trying to do a multi-platform launch almost killed me. It was just a lot of work for me personally. I underestimated how much of my effort would have to go into that no matter what, just learning five different backends and setting up five different storefronts with each language. So getting all the translations set up on each storefront. Each storefront has their own requirements, not just for images, but for everything. I had to manage five different builds. If I found a bug, I had to fix that bug in five different places. And this is on top of the language specific problems and the platform specific problems. So like certain things you have to do just for search on one platform or another, or just in a certain language on certain platforms and others. It just became a, a combinate, like no one thing was awful, but all of these things in aggregate were just way too much uh, for not only one person, but for even spending a lot of money. I, I just couldn't keep up with the amount of work required to launch on all these platforms at the same time. If I could do it again, I would have released first on PC. 
and then on Stadia or Switch and then on the other platforms one at a time as needed. Um, and I, I'll tell you, the the one platform that I didn't sim ship with was Stadia because Stadia didn't launch until November and I came out in October. So I had a, another month to work with Stadia and that was a much more pleasant launch for me. I got to work with the marketing team there. I got to make sure our, our messaging aligned. I, I got to get my marketing materials together for the store. Um, I had time to learn the back end. By the time I was submitting the final cert for Stadia, I'd already fixed all the bugs for the main game. So I knew any bugs that showed up on Stadia were Stadia specific problems, which was something that I didn't have for the other platforms. There was times when I'd get a bug in on the Xbox and I wasn't sure if it was on every platform or just only on the Xbox. So again, I, I would, if I could do it again, I, I would have um, focused only on one storefront. And I can tell you specifically for Kine, the PS4 and the Xbox uh, port were the ones that were not worth it. I mean, I can't legally say how many units I sold on each platform, but if you combine the Xbox One and the PS4 sales, they're less than 5% of my total sales. Um, and this makes sense. Uh, largely, this is because I didn't reach out to Microsoft or Sony. I didn't participate in any marketing with them. I thought, I thought if I marketed the game in general, it would have some kind of splash effect on every platform. I, 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 I was a bit naive. I didn't think to reach out to Microsoft and Sony, and I didn't have the time because I was shipping on everything to reach out specifically to Microsoft and Sony and, and try to leverage um, whatever their marketing channels would have been. Also, just in general, I, I find people don't, people who play puzzle games, my users, gamers who play puzzle games, they tend to play on the go on the Switch or on the phone. Um, some people who want the more hardcore games will play on their PC. Puzzle gamers generally don't sit at their couch to play puzzle games. Maybe for a game like Gris or a, more of a game you sink into, perhaps. But um, games that are difficult, that are um, difficult puzzle games, people tend to prefer those on other platforms. So that was my biggest mistake in Scope 3, was sim shipping on so many platforms. I wish I'd been more focused, uh, specifically in my case, probably on Stadia and PC and Switch. <clears throat> In any case, that's the story and some of the things I learned along the way of how I spent how I spent two and a half years and four hundred twenty thousand dollars in a puzzle game. Uh, and I'm gonna leave you with a couple of closing thoughts, just what went right and wrong over the entire project. The way I made this game was iterative. I made a scope of the game, and then when I had the resources and I, I knew the game deserved to be a bigger scope, that was when I increased the scope. I did not sit down and plan to make a massive game and then a game that I couldn't fund myself, right? I find that that's the worst situation to be in. If you come up with a massive game where you can't personally fund it and you're going around pitching your, your small prototype, hoping you get funding, you're in a very bad spot. You It's difficult to stay confident. Uh, it, you're, you're just not in a good negotiating position with whoever needs to give you money. Um, you're just assuming a lot more risk there. Personally, I the way I work and the way I would recommend working is to design iteratively and scope up as you know that the game deserves to be a bigger scope and as you can acquire funding to make that bigger scope. I, there's a great deal of confidence that comes with knowing that you have enough money in the bank account to ship what you're currently working on. I find that that's really important. There's been times in my career when I haven't had that and that's maddening. I would highly recommend against it. Um, as far as... The rest, other things from the game, I'm really happy with how the art worked out. Uh, I don't think the way it was, I wouldn't recommend the way I constructed it, but I, I'm really happy with how it ended up in the end. Uh, as far as takeaways for Kynum, uh, let's see here. Yes, I, I think launching on Stadia was smart. Um, I'm glad I did that. There was 22 titles on Stadia when it launched, and Kynum was one of them. And that, because there were so few, that gave me a lot of press. Uh, I am really proud that I got to work with Stadia. Like that was pretty cool that I pulled that off. Um, but on the other hand, I wish I didn't launch on all the other platforms. Launching on so many platforms at the same time just ended up being a lot of work uh, that I don't think was worth it. And as far as design goes, I didn't put enough thought into the player experience when the player is stuck on a puzzle. So this is a point that I don't think really fits into any specific scope, but I really wanted to touch on because it's something important that I missed. The user experience 
when a player is stuck in kind is very bad. And a large part of this is how the puzzles were structured. It's the core point of the game, right? Like kind is a game that tells us a story using puzzles. And the part of the way I tell that narrative is as soon as you beat a puzzle, you um, jump to the next one immediately in a sequence and you see a little bit of dialogue and then you beat the next puzzle and you jump to the next one and you see a bit of dialogue. So a player is encouraged to continuously play the game. A player almost never sees the level select screen. Compare this to an experience like Baba is You. In this game, you complete a puzzle and you're immediately kicked out to the level select screen. Every time you beat a puzzle, you're kicked back out to it and you have a lot of different puzzles to choose from. It doesn't feel like there's any set order. Um, in this game, if you're stuck and you back out to the level select screen, that doesn't feel quite as much like failure because you see the level select screen all the time. In Kine, when you back out to the level select screen, it feels like failure. It's not something you do unless you're stuck. Uh, and because of that, there's a lot more player friction. Players generally don't want to do that. It's just a more negative experience. And I think in general, what I needed to do was spend more time looking at players that were struggling, uh, looking at players that were not, did not grok the game immediately, did not get it uh, as easily. I think if I was more focused on making sure that those players were still having fun or uh, I would have caught this earlier on. So those are some of my takeaways and that's the story of how Kine was made. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't do this talk at GDC, but I'm glad you guys get to see it either way. My name is Gwen. Kine is out now. I hope you check it out. You can reach me on Twitch. I'm sorry, this way. Dire Goldfish on Twitch. If this is streamed, then hopefully I'll be in the chat. Uh, I'm also Dire Goldfish on Twitter and I am on YouTube. Um, because we couldn't do this at GDC because of the coronavirus, I hope you're all staying healthy. Please reach out to me with any questions you have. Hit me up on Twitter and I'll, um, I'll reply as best I can. Thank you.